Thank you. So welcome everyone. Happy Friday. And you are here joining us at our rate work group meeting. Uh, this session right now, if we could scroll right on, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of information to share and um, we want to move through that information uh, so that we get to the conclusion of this deck as well for you all today. Um, couple of things that I want to go over for housekeeping. This rate setting work group meeting is open to the public. Our work group members are here joining us. They should have mic and camera functions. If not, go ahead and flag something in the chat or raise your hand if you don't have access to the chat if you're a work group member. And we'll go ahead and make sure that we can work through that IT issue if there's any type of setting that we need to fix. Um, we want to make sure that we have as many people as possible joining today and providing their information. If you're a member of the public and have questions about some of the information that you see or hear today, please, please don't hesitate to email BDS. Um, the email address is here, bds at dhhs.nh.gov, so that we can review your feedback and get some information back to you as soon as possible. Also, this meeting is being supported by a live cart captioner. So in order to enable this feature, you would want to go ahead and click on the more button at the top ribbon on your screen right now. It's the, the ellipsis, the three dots. Uh, and once you do that, you select language and speech. And then from that menu, you're going to go ahead and select turn on live captions. All right, so I'm jumping right into the content. Um, first thing that I want to give this group an update about is around the cost report um, for last month. As you recall, we did some work and in previous sessions too, there's been a lot of work in developing a cost report, brought it to this group. We got a lot of really good feedback from you all that allowed us to kind of go back internally, uh, take a look at some, some information that you shared. And what we have determined is that we are not going to do and move forward right now with a fiscal year 24 cost report. Um, so no cost report is coming out next month. We want to focus efforts on a fiscal year 25 cost report and more information will come out about that in the future. We want to make sure that we're still focusing on the cost report structure so that we can get that out to folks well before the reporting time would come in, especially based on some of the feedback we got last month in terms of the data that should be, you know, folks would want to be aware of right now, for example, in putting that together. So again, thank you to this group for the feedback. No cost report coming, and there are more conversations going on about that. We did share that, I believe, with the provider group, um, with our a, with our area agency team as well. We just want to make sure that we're getting the word out to folks. Uh, Matt has a question. Go for it, Matt. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to tell you how much we appreciate, or I appreciate your uh, pushing that off for us. So we can continue to catch up to all the change. Um, but my big question is Myers and Softwares, are we still going to have them next year? So our partners of Myers and Software are here working with us. We want to make sure that they are helping to guide us through content such as a cost report. We definitely have pockets of excellence within um, DHHS and we are ensuring they're at the table and we want to make sure that we are continuing to collaborate with Myers as well on that work. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you, Matt. And I think we have one other question. Is it, it looks like Melissa. Uh, you know what? I believe Melissa might be a guest participant and not on the rate work group. So, uh, Jess Kennedy, just I want to make sure I'm not saying something that's not true. Is Melissa able to communicate with the group through the chat at this time? Yes. All right. So since that aren't on the work group can enter questions into the chat. If for some reason your chat is not enabled, it might be because of your organization's uh, security settings, in which case you can send us an email and we will monitor that throughout this meeting as well. Great. Thank you so much. So just one quick reminder, the rate work group members and that that group that is on the rate work group should have access with mic and camera. 
If you're joining as a member of the public, as Jess just shared, you have access via chat. You can always send um, questions to bds at dhhs.nh.gov if for some reason your agency's settings do not allow for you to utilize or access the chat uh, so that we can get your feedback and information too. So for the, and I'll go back to the chat at some point or if someone on our team can just let me know if Melissa's question comes through and we'll go ahead and circle back to it. So for today, we are hoping to talk about some of our assessment informed rates. So the first content that we wanna do is just that rate implementation, have a conversation there. And then we want to do a quick um, recap of the rate methodology and development, the work that's happened so far, the input that our work group has done or has provided. And also we're aware that we have several audience members joining today who might not have been part of that discussion. So we just, again, a little bit of recap, some foundational information before we jump into the rates themselves, uh, which would be our last bullet point uh, to talk about some of those rates. So if we could go ahead and move along to the next slide, please. Okay, so first and foremost, what we wanna share with you all is as we begin rolling up some of the information as our, our, our partners at Myers were taking that information, applying it to the buildup for the rates, BDS, as some of you are aware, engaged in a fair amount of stakeholder engagement over the winter and the early spring. We really wanted to talk to people about priority areas, and I, I think as a surprise to no one on this group and on this call, uh, rates and um, wages especially came up as a top priority from all of the groups. And those groups were individuals and families, um, service coordinators, providers, our area agency partners, really just that shared and collective feedback that rates were a key priority. But there was so much more information that went into or that we got from that that maybe didn't talk about rates specifically, but helped us to focus on how we might approach a phase in or what we have ultimately um, determined to in, and we're proposing today as a phase in approach. So some of that feedback, you know, came from individuals and families and providers, et cetera, saying that there are delays in accessing services because of that that perceived barrier, that very real barrier they shared with us about how the rate might be currently. Um, there was a lot of conversation about the availability of respite services in New Hampshire and from the perspective of our stakeholders, you know, really just that reimbursement amount being one of the barriers there. Um, there was a lot of requests for additional supports and resources for family or for family caregivers. And we have those who are, you know, aging or through that process of aging, but, you know, also hearing that, um, you know, from the transition into adult services age too, and specifically with the aspect of how and how provider availability really is what that was speaking to in certain contexts, not all contexts. Then, too, from our service providers and our service coordinators, our area agencies, really striving to be able to offer increased opportunities for community involvement and inclusion and asking for us to focus specifically on the services that best support those or those activities. Um, also, a request for us to really make sure we don't lose sight of employment and we're expanding opportunities for competitive and integrated employment. And just the the straightforward ask from folks to to take a look at community participation services and community support services and what those current rates look like and what they could look like, especially, um, you know, if we want to focus on providing services in the community as much and as often as someone is seeking. So taking all of that information in and also considering some other feedback that we received um, for us to make sure that we're looking at the services that that mirror all of that feedback or that spoke to all of that feedback. So how do we select something and how do we move forward with a, a plan or an approach that increases access, provides that relief and support by way of potentially increasing capacity from a provider standpoint, um, and then expand increase and expand community resources for individuals and families and expand employment opportunities. But also through this feedback and, you know, Lori and I in various in previous work that's happened um, over the last year or so, really hearing the feedback from you all too to consider 
a phased in approach, something that allows us to test and evaluate how things are going and correct for those things before we have a full implementation. Um, make sure that there's plenty of opportunity and space for feedback and engagement so people can share with us, you know, all of these same groups we talked to about what they saw and desired from the service system in general, how do they think things are going. And then also other feedback that we received that was taken into account is how do we minimize the impact to stakeholders while also maximizing the impact to stakeholders. And let me unpack that just a little bit. So minimizing the impact in way of administrative burden. Um, we heard a, a, a echoed multiple times from families, individuals, providers, service coordinators that, you know, there is, um, you know, just as they are approaching different and, um, you know, tasks that they may have in their day to day to please consider not, you know, an approach that might not add to that, um, enhance it certainly, but not add to it. But also when I say maximize the impact, you know, the availability of different rates and what that might do to availability of service providers. So with all of that in mind, um, we have, and today what we will be discussing is a phased in rate implementation approach, starting with community support services, community participation services, respite and supported employment services through the traditional program model. As we evaluated all of the stakeholder feedback for very specific reasons, these services would meet that these are all community based services that expand opportunities for um, support in the community to help individuals live as independently as they choose. Also expands by way of potentially um, impacting that respite rate. Um, expands the options that families might have when they're seeking respite. And these services specifically, we forecast, and again, we're at the point where we're forecasting what we think those potential impacts would be. We're just at the beginning of this. Um, we've, we forecast and predict that this would have as little administrative burden as possible because these are current services that we have in our developmental disability waiver and would not require a amendment, for example, or changes from external partners to things, different structures we have to allow funding such as service authorizations. These are things that we hope or we anticipate could happen on the back end so that we could all start testing are those, is that accurate? Is there an impact outside um, before we were to move into another service? So I, I think the overall spirit that I'm trying to convey is that we really, truly tried to listen to what everybody was saying about this work ahead of us, but also different key learnings from work that has happened in the past and try to apply all of that feedback into an approach that felt like it was meeting as many needs as possible and also sensitive and respectful to the work that's happening right now day to day. So if we could move into, oh, we do have... We have a question from Ellen. Uh, hey, Jessica. Um, uh, wanted to echo Matt's thanks on the push out to uh, the, the cost report. Um, <clears throat> I, I might have missed the early sending out of the deck. If so, I apologize because <clears throat> I might there might be slides that I'm missing. So, of course, you know, when you put out information like this, I want more information. So, spoiler <laughs> alert, um, you know, fiscal year 26, it's a ways off. I'm surprised it's not, you know, um, able to be rolled out this year. So, could you speak to that? And then I have a follow-up question on that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually a nice segue into our into our next slide. But I'll start with the deck. First off, apologies, folks. Typically, we try to get the deck out to you the Wednesday before the presentation. I will say the team has been working right up until almost right before this presentation to make sure that we were sharing this information in the best way possible that considered new folks joining that might not have been level set in some of this work. Also, the feedback from the stakeholder engagement. So all of that is to say, with apologies, that the deck will be coming out um, today or ASAP. Uh, perhaps, you know, it's going to be sent out at some point very soon. Uh, but uh, again, with apologies that it wasn't sent out ahead of time, as we usually strive for. 
Um, fiscal year 26. So let's kind of move into the next slide and give a little bit of an idea. So this is by no means an implementation plan. But it, it, some... I'm sorry, he just 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 to finish it. So maybe you could address it in this um, is that in specifically then the rate I was interested in and I was like looking for this for like that timeline is service coordination um, is such a top priority because of the shift of responsibilities that have been put on that. Um, so if you could sort of speak to, you know, what's comprised in the secondary and remaining, like to, you know, where would service coordination fall in that? Where would residential fall in that? that that'd be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank so you. thank you. I'll be quiet now. You don't have to be quiet, Ellen. These are good questions. And I'm sure if you have them, others do too. So as we talk about the, let's say these first four services in the traditional model, us looking at a time period of uh, 1 1 2026, understanding some of the work that'll have to happen first. So, as folks who, so just a little bit of information on our budgeting process. Uh, right now, we're beginning some of those conversations for our next budget cycle, which starts on 7 1 of 25. So as you know, if we start to plot that out on a timeline, one one of 2026, knowing that we may, um, you know, it, that those resources might come to the department on one one of 2025, uh, we, it is a, a quick turnaround time for sure. Uh, so we wanted to keep that in mind and make sure that it was doable if we're sharing. So knowing that one one of twenty, excuse me, seven one of twenty five until one one of twenty six was about a six month turnaround. So that's why if, if folks are feeling, gee, one one twenty six, it feels so far out. I think if we kind of look at some of those steps and when they would happen, um, that's a, a little bit of the rationale as to why that date was picked. Um, for those four services, as I mentioned, we we forecast that that would have minimal administrative impact. And when I say minimal, I, I do want to emphasize the forecast portion of that. We know that as we talk to people and as we engage in this communication, um, you know, throughout this work, beginning, during, after, to test all of this information and make sure these theories are accurate, um, that we would have a we would expect to hear other learnings and we would incorporate those accordingly. Uh, so when we moved into our next step would be to move into a PDMS phase on 1-1-2027. During that time, and please, I, I hope no one perceives this as us putting PDMS down until at that time, we actually have participated in a couple of listening sessions on PDMS and we want to talk to people about PDMS. How is it going? Look at some of those structures. Right now, participant directed and managed services are a self-determined service, independently determined, excuse me. Um, so just making sure that with the community, we're able to look at all aspects at once, understand the full impact, make sure that we're communicating the full impact um, of various structures up to and including fiscal management services and all of those pieces. Then, Ellen, and I think this is going to be the heart of the response to your question or the most direct response to your question for um, fiscal year 28 and within that time frame is when we would look at the balance of the services, taking all of that information and especially applying it to services as important as residential, for example. Um, service coordination, it because it did receive some increase, and please note that I'm not implying that that was you know, as much as folks are have shared that they would like to see, but because it did recently receive some increases, um, you know, evaluating the other services and what the community was saying, how could we tap those to make sure we're we're encouraging and supporting those inclusive community services. With service coordination especially, we also have um, a, something called parity in, within our system, which essentially just means that of all of the service coordination and like services, we at BDS wouldn't be able to move forward without our partners and other agencies who also offer case management services to just make sure that there was parity in those rates. So I'm so sorry, such a long-winded response to it, but it, it was a kind of a multifaceted response. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And um, I just wanted to uh, verify when you talk about the PDMS engagement, you mentioned FMS rates. Does that also sort of assume the rollout of broker services? 
Uh, no, nothing is assumed within our participant directed and managed services. This is service or support broker, as it's called in many states, is a service that's available in self-direction. What we've heard from the community so far is some some pro, some con on that notion. You know, some people really feel strongly that another support would be helpful, but others have also cautioned that, gee, you know, there are a lot of things we would want to understand before that to make sure that it doesn't add an additional step in the process. So before we were to move forward with anything, we want to make sure that our PDMS community is fully engaged and they have all of the information available so that we can make the best decisions possible for our system based on what people are asking for and what they feel the best support would be. Okay, and then just sorry, last follow up is um, then when you mention the FMS rate, is that a you're going to consider its implementation or that would be implemented by 7127? I think as we look at fiscal management services, and I was talking about it more in a concept, not so, or, you know, as okay. a service itself, not so much as a rate. But okay. I think the hope would be if we, as we approach participant directed, and Ellen, your questions are spot on to exactly why we wanted to make sure that we had a fair amount, a robust amount of community engagement before we entered into some of the PDMS changes that would be required. Okay. Um, so, I mean, thank you for bringing this up because it, it just goes to show there's there's so much for us to get into within participant directed and managed services. And as we all start to evaluate those impacts, we also wanna make sure we're engaging with the community for their perceived impacts to the pros and the cons of any step we might make. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Matt. Yeah, Ellen was spot on with three of the questions I have, so I'm, I'm down to one. Um, okay. When we're looking at the parity between the different case management services and case management service coordination, you know, tomato, tomato, um, there is a like a targeted aspect to it, which makes it different but similar. Um, and the other case management services, to my understanding, are provided under licensed uh, organizations that are not area agencies. Are the area agencies, um, are we going to be looking towards having to be licensed at some point as case management for that parity? And then um, is there, are you saying that they're so similar in services that there is no enhancement that's going to be expected to go along with um, the targeted aspects of service coordination. So I'll take the last one first and no, we're definitely not making any um, decisions or sharing any information today about, about that component. Um, what we're doing in the meantime, and these are, are great questions, Matt, and they're ones that we've had internally at the department over the last year or so, working in partnership with um, Office of Legal and Regulatory Services and um, different individuals. You know, right now, there aren't any changes anticipated in that realm. Our area agencies are designated by the state. So if there are case management services that are offered, um, that is a similar oversight structure to those case management agencies that are licensed. So, um, you know, definitely we continue to make sure we're at the table as folks are talking about parity um, in rates, but also talking about distinction in services so that we can best represent what service coordination and the developmental services looks like, um, where, you know, those points of difference, the similarities, and just make sure that we are providing that information as it's asked of us, but no changes um, in forecasted right now that I am aware of. Lastly, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you guys saying we don't know yet. Um, that's a level of honesty that is really appreciated. I also have to say thank you very much for taking the time to make things a lot more um, community involved. So I, I have a lot of hope for the process moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Matt. I, I hope folks on this call feel that the BDS team, you know, they I like to say we we lead with our hearts and we also have some of those, um, you know, those back end functions. You know, we, we're becoming subject matter experts and things that we never thought we would learn about. But I as I said before, with the other slide, I, I truly hope folks see that we 
we listened, we heard, and we listened, and we used that information to bring what's in front of you. Now, I'm not saying there won't be questions as we go through it. The questions are good from my perspective because it helps us make sure we're evaluating and taking all the right information in. So I'm going to move us into the next slide so that we can, I, I know folks are probably so excited for us to get to the last couple of slides. So the next series of slides, I'm gonna do a few, our partners over at Myers and Stauffer are gonna do a few, and these are meant to kind of just level set the group. This is information that some of you all on our rate work group have seen already. So apologies, but knowing that there would be a fair number of audience members joining today, just a, a reset in some of the information that's been shared over the last several months about the rate buildup process and the SIS. So first, quick recap of the supports intensity scale, um, because that is a component that is tied to determining a service level for someone. And, and Leslie and Crystal will get into that and touch upon that a bit more specifically as it um, relates to a rate in a couple of slides. But for now, just to remind folks, the support intensity scale um, and those assessments that happen from a service planning standpoint, all sections of the SIS should be used. They do enhance that person-centered planning process. As you all have shared in the past, though, when they're done appropriately, when the interviewer is very clear on the questions and the individual or their support circle is also familiar and understands the rationale. So we're aware that, you know, there, there are some details there that can lead to the ideal and optimal outcome as well as others not, but in its spirit, all sections of the SIS are intended to enhance service planning. From a service and a rate standpoint, the SIS A is going to be utilized to identify support needs in certain very specific areas, specifically their home living activities, community living activities, medical and behavioral supports that might be needed, health and safety activities, and then there are some supplemental questions. Those sections inform rates because they've been shown to most closely relate to those support needs of the individual, as I mentioned, and that's what has that direct impact on which, um, which rate it might match to. Uh, but what I want to remind folks about and has been shared here is that the SIS will not be used and it is not intended to be used or are we moving in the direction for it to be used to select services or service providers to determine the frequency or duration of services. Simply put that how often you need a service um, and how often per week and how many hours maybe per day or per week. The SIS is not used for that. Assigning any type of total budget amount, that's not the intention of the SIS, or for eligibility or access to the waiver services. That is a different process that is not done through the SIS. And then we can go to the, and also just as a reference, when you guys get the DAC in the appendix, the full, there's a listing of all of the SIS sections, if that's helpful. So folks that are wondering what all the sections of the SIS are, will be able to see that in the appendix. Okay, now with that information, I am going to tag in our partners from Myers and Stauffer to go through some of the rate buildup information before we get into the rates themselves. Good morning, everybody. So I'm gonna kind of give an overview of the proposed methodology. Um, we're gonna start and kind of just look at the overall segments of what we do. And we're looking at a rate buildup methodology which the buildup starts, the base of this methodology is your direct service professionals. It's your, your DSP wages. So that, you know, because direct care labor is kind of the driver of costs, that's why we use it as the base of the rate. We're then gonna add on different components to that wage in order to get to the final rate. So we're gonna look at employer related benefits and taxes. We're actually going to look at a productivity factor, which takes into account that paid time of the DSP that might not be billable time. And we'll go into more detail as I walk through the components. We then have program related expenses. That's your supervisor time, your program materials and supplies, transportation and medication management if they're applicable. And then we also have the administrative expenses so that overall expense just to operate your organization and kind of all of that information then gets added up into the rate. The next slide 
is going to show, and you can see this is an example. So there's there's no basis in this example for any services or, or anything in New Hampshire, but we wanted to kind of show how it works and how it does build up. So we have that wage, we have the employer related benefits of that DSP wage, that productivity factor that I talked about, that all adds together to kind of give us a total uh, wage and benefits per hour cost. Then we add on if there is transportation as part of the service, if there's medication management as part of the service, those get added on. We then do the program related expenses, which is a percent of the wage. And then the administrative percentage, which is a percent of the total cost per hour. All of that then gets added together to give us a total cost per hour. So we're going to walk through all of the different components here, kind of where that information came from um, so that you can kind of understand how it was built. So we have a question from Ellen. Um, <clears throat> so I think you'll get into it. So I'll hold off my question. I had a question on the productivity factor, but I was wondering if you could speak to um, in the in the last you know year or so, um, as people have been grappling with sort of shifting of responsibilities, and I think service coordination is definitely one of them, where they said, well, there's more um, responsibilities being put on service coordinators. We need to sort of look at what that definition was, as if that would impact the rate. And I recall you kind of saying. It won't impact the rate. It will impact. And I don't know if this is the right slide to explain that, but I think because there are a lot of people on this call who have probably had that question, if you could just do a little sidebar and address that, that'd be great. If you don't think it's appropriate for right now, then that's fine. But I'll try and give it brief. I'm hoping that like, I don't want to necessarily get it down a rabbit hole of questions. No, I know. Right? Because um, we won't talk about service coordination today, but this, all of these different components are kind of a, a standard, but all of these components might not be used for every service. So for service coordination, as we were talking through all of the changes that are kind of happening, and some of the information we got from the cost report for service coordination was caseload. And so as we talk about service coordination, we went the caseload route and we're looking more at caseload mm -hmm. and not necessarily productivity and number of hours and, and all of that. So, okay. so that, thank you. So it, that comes up in the productivity factor section. Um, well, for service coordination, it actually would not have a productivity factor. Correct. Component because we did caseload instead. Okay, and the caseload would be reflected in the, <clears throat> where would the caseload have been taken into consideration in these little various buckets at this level? It would not. We would calculate a total cost per hour, and then okay. we would apply caseload to calculate the rate. Got you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me make sure. Yeah, as we talk through, so we're going to start with this direct care wages, benefits and productivity, kind of go through each each piece of that. So we'll start with the wages. Just as kind of a reminder, uh, it seems crazy that it's been over a year ago now, but back in February through June of 2023, uh, we did work with the rate work group um, and had meetings around occupational codes and weights um, and kind of composite calculations to look at wages. So that feedback and uh, discussion that we had back then has been used in the proposed um, wages that we're looking at. Now, since then, we have had an update to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the proposed DSP wages that are currently in the methodology are from May of 2023, which was released in April of 2024. So it's the most updated BLS wages that we have. Because that is using May 2023 data, we then also are um, proposing an inflation 
uh, percentage that comes from that employment cost index. And right now that's an additional 13.66%. So we have those wages plus inflation that goes into that base. I did kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, we do have some services where there were multiple occupation codes that we felt um, fit within the service description. So in that case, we have those multiple occupation codes and then they're weighted in order to calculate a composite hourly wage. On top of that, we calculate composite hourly wages. We might change the occupational categories or we might change the weights as we increase that level of supports for a specific service. So that's something that can also vary if we have multiple rates for a service, as we move up those uh, support needs, we would change those occupational codes and those weights. The next component then, employer-related benefits. So we took the cost survey data and took the employer-related expenses and benefits from the cost surveys, calculated as a percentage of total salaries for each provider. So took the cost surveys, calculated that percentage, and then we determined the median of those percentages. One of the things that we have done with those percentages is the Bureau of Labor Statistics does uh, track employer-related expense and benefit information. And so we do look at that. We also look at the Internal Revenue Service data as far as taxes, and kind of look and say, okay, you know, what's the most recent BLS data look like and how does it compare to what we saw on the cost surveys? So we've done that throughout the project and we did compare that to the most recent information that was released in June, 2024. And, and the percentage that we're including is still um, comparable to, um, to that data. Sure, I'm not missing anything in my notes. Okay. So the next component is that productivity factor. So like I said earlier, this is to account for those DSP hours that are worked and paid, but not included in the billable service time. And we wanna make sure that that's accounted for in the rate methodology. So that's gonna include things like your PTO, your training hours, and then things like um, staff meetings and travel time and documentation time, no shows, um, things that just aren't included in billable time, but you know that um, your DSPs are getting paid for it. This information um, also came from the cost surveys. This component in the rate methodology is a little bit different in that we took, um, we take the sum of the DSP wage and the benefits, and it gets multiplied times this productivity factor in order to give us that total wage and benefit cost. And then that component is, is kind of backed into. So um, that, that productivity factor gets multiplied times the wage plus the benefits. I saw a comment just come through. Um, holiday time is included in that PTO. So PTO will include um, holidays, vacation, and sick. Okay, I'm going to walk through each of these. So your pay time off days per year. So once again, this is your holidays, your vacation, and your sick. We took the data from the cost surveys and determined a median of 200 total paid time off hours from those surveys. So that's an equivalent to 25 paid time off days per year. We do wanna note that the numbers from the cost reports include not only experienced staff, but also new staff. So if there's a lot of turnover, your newer staff have you know less time that they are eligible for, it, kind of, it brings down that median. Also, um, we see the part-time staff don't always get all of the, the days that maybe your full-time staff do. So these numbers are including your new and experienced staff, your part-time and your full-time staff. So we know that you probably do have some staff that are getting you know, more hours than this, 
but it's it's taking all of that into consideration to get to that number. As far as the training hours, we use turnover percentages and training hours from the cost surveys to determine service specific medians. So these numbers are different depending on the service. The turnover percentages uh, were applied. We had requested first year um, of employment training hours and subsequent year training hours on the cost surveys. So we took those, applied that turnover percentage to calculate an average uh, training hours per year for each service. From those cost surveys, we also um, asked about additional hours for individuals with um, increased behavioral and or medical needs. So those training hours were then uh, looked at, we calculated medians, and then that was included as we move up. If a service has different rate levels as we move up, about the, the level of supports, those training hours would then get applied in the rate methodology as we move up those levels of support. The last piece then of the productivity factor is that billable hours. So, you know, looking at that non billable time. Once again, we use the cost survey data to calculate average billable hours per week as a percentage of total hours worked per week. Once again, for each service, uh, we then determined the median of those percentages and then multiplied that times 40 hours a week. Not every organization had a 40 hour uh, total hours worked per week uh, for each service. And so, you know, the percentages that came from the cost surveys, we used the total hours from those cost surveys, but then we took it and made sure that we were looking at it. Um, consistently as we put it in the rate methodology. So we did multiply times 40 hours a week to get that number of hours. Okay, so that's kind of it for that, that base, you know, wages, benefits, and productivity to calculate that total um, wage and benefit DSP cost per hour that now we're going to build on with some additional information. So program related expenses. The program related expenses is gonna include supervisor time, uh, program materials and supplies and other expenses that are directly related to service provision that are not you know, your DSP wages. Um, we used program related expenses from the cost surveys calculated as a percent of DSP wages for each provider and service. So did that at the cost survey level, and then we looked at all of our cost surveys, determined the median of those percentages for each service. So this program related expense could be different um, depending on uh, each service. So it's not going to be consistent through the services. And I think I forgot to mention employer related benefits that is consistent. Um, for the services. So that's kind of a global percentage that we look at uh, for everything. The productivity factor, the program related expenses, those are going to be different depending on each service. So the program related expenses, transportation. If transportation is a part of service provision, um, there will be a separate component that is you know, kind of transparent in the methodology for that transportation piece. We used mileage data from the cost surveys to determine average miles for each applicable service. So once again, this is you know, service driven, different from each service. We also looked at claims data to kind of analyze and say, okay, kind of what's the number of service days per week for each applicable service? And it took all of that information together uh, the cost per hour is calculated using the current IRS mileage rate. So we use that mileage data that we compiled. We take the IRS mileage rate to calculate that cost per hour part of the methodology. We also wanted to note that there is a specialized transportation add on rate um, that has been calculated that uses an increased mileage rate. And it's being proposed for um, 
applicable services to account for increased expenses related to individuals that have specialized transportation needs. I saw a comment come through the chat. Can you define supervisor? Is this the frontline supervisor director? Um, I, yes, so from the cost surveys, there were three staffing worksheets. There was the administrative staff, there was the program related staff, and there was the direct staff. So the program related uh, staff, if you included um, staff there, that is staff. So it isn't really just supervisors. It might be other program related um, non DSP uh, positions, but that's where that cost would have come from from the survey. So if you included them on that program related section. Um, did you take into account mileage based on location? So more rural services that may take 45 minutes to get to the location versus 15 minutes save for CSS. And that was discussed. Um, no, we didn't, um, you know, didn't necessarily have a lot of detailed mileage data from the cost surveys. So we did what we could um, and, you know, talking through all that and, and what looks reasonable. Um, this is kind of one of those things that as you guys move forward and if there's a, a rebase down the road that it can be better looked at as providers are um, tracking additional data and tracking more detailed data that can help the methodology going forward. So, oh, um, what kind of support is there to incentivize care providers to travel to remote areas where there is a workforce shortage? I don't know if Lori or Jess, you want to kind of speak to that. I think as we kind of go through some of this information, we'll we'll see how it's all applied into the rate. And also, uh, in addition to talking and working with our provider agencies, of course, as they figure that out and how they might take that into account within a wage, for example, too. Um, we might be able to have, I guess what I'm trying to say is in a few slides, we might be able to have a more um, fully rounded conversation on that, if it's okay if we just hold that. And, and I just want to jump to Sue's question. I think, oh, Leslie, you could probably answer it. You go ahead. No, no Laura, you go ahead. Oh, so for the specialized transportation, that's exactly what we were looking at when we were developing that rate, Sue, is the additional cost of um, specialized vehicles. And so a lot of work went into, you know, evaluating that and coming up with that rate. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess if you don't mind, I'll just add another comment too. when we're talking about these components. And when we get to the rate, there's no mandate that that portion of the rate needs to be utilized to pay for that um, component. So this is just how we calculated the rates, but there are no requirements that say for that component in the rate for transportation, that's what it has to be spent on. So I just want to preface that with these rates. Because these are, I mean, these are statewide rates. They're, they're not provider specific rates, so just a statewide rate. So however you guys, you know, work within this rate, that's what you'll do as an organization. OK, medication management. So once again, medication management, um, if it's included as part of a service provision, we then have a separate component um, for medication management. We used the cost survey expense information. We had asked specific questions about um, RNs and nurse training and kind of you know what they did with that, that nurse training. So we took cost survey information related to nurses and that nurse training calculated as a percent of DSP wages for each provider and applicable service. Kind of see a, a trend going with some of these. Uh, and then we determined the median of those percentages for each service. So making sure that we are accounting for that medication management piece and being transparent that it's being included in there. So that's kind of then our program related expenses. Now we have the administrative expense component. This once again was calculated from the cost surveys. We looked at um, adjusted general and administrative expenses. 
um, and adjusted total cost survey expense. So we're not including anything that's non-reimbursable or not allowable for uh, Medicaid waiver services. So that doesn't include room and board or any other you know, non-reimbursable waiver expenses. We calculated a, a GNA expense percentage of total cost for each provider. And then we determined the median of those percentages. This again is a global component similar to the employer related benefits. So this administrative expense is applied for all services. So it's the same percentage uh, across the board for those services. Okay. So I see if there's any questions before we get into kind of what you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Ellen. Ellen, you might be on mute. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, good to see you, Leslie. Uh, could you just go back to the previous slide? And again, I'm just thinking for folks uh, on the call, could you just talk about at a high level what the you know administrative expenses, like examples of those, like? Um... So I guess for those of you who did cost surveys or if you've seen the cost survey, um, I mentioned a little bit ago, there was the admin staffing worksheet where you did your your positions that were administrative in nature so you can't necessarily say that um, it's applicable to cps service or um you know residential services it's a, a position that you have that kind of just is an overarching position of your organization so those individuals would be included in your admin expense um, and then we had an administrative expenses section. So once again, it's that general overhead of your organization. So occupancy expense um, that's you know not related to service provision. Um, legal expenses that I, we had legal expenses up in program related if it, you could directly assign it. Mm -hmm. um, to the program, but a lot of them, it, it's not. You might have legal expenses that were, you know, for a, a specific individual or something. Those would be in there. Postage is a, a good example. We see utilities that are related to the occupancy. Um, we see some transportation. You know, you have a, an organization who has a, a few vehicles that your staff uses, not necessarily for service provision. That would be down in um, the, the admin section. If you might have home office expenses. Um, there were quite a few lines that were down there in that that yeah. admin piece. Thanks. That, I think that's helpful. I, I think it's just to get the flavor of that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kim had a question. Does the wage data take into account geographic differences? We did look at geographic differences uh, from the BLS data for all of the different uh, metropolitan and not metropolitan. Uh, for the occupational codes that we were using, and there wasn't a, kind of a large enough discrepancy that we felt was, you know, I guess there wasn't a big enough in order to kind of implement that and put that into uh, the right methodology. And that's something that as you know, as this moves forward, you know, if there is a rebase, then that could be looked at again to see if any if there are any changes that could necessitate that down the road. But as of right now, we just didn't necessarily see that from the data. Shelly. Hi. So did you use for this section the percentage of time of waiver admin activities that was in the cost report? Hold on. I'm going to say yes, I believe so. I do not have a lot of things open. I do not have a cost report open. I mean, it makes sense. You have FMS, DADS, eligibility, fundraising, marketing, room and board, and facilities, waiver admin, and then others. So I'm assuming that is what you yep. do. 
it's the waiver admin piece that then got allocated over onto the cost report. Because yes, if you put something to FMS, then it would have gone into the FMS methodology. If you put it to DAS, it would have gone to the DAS methodology. Um, your marketing, that's actually non-reimbursable uh, for waiver, and then your facilities room and board. So that would be your non-reimbursable. So yes, that, that percent of waiver admin is what went in there um, over into the, the total. OK, thank you. Yep. OK. Thank you. So I'm going to hop in just really quick before Leslie and Krista jump into the rates themselves. So as we mentioned earlier, today's discussion is going to cover community participation services, community support services, respite in supported employment, which is what we're proposing be in that, that initial phase in for moving towards these, these new rates. Um, and again, these are on our developmental disabilities waiver. Um, a if we could flip to the next slide quick, just a, a couple of things to kind of just ground us as we go through and look at some of the rates. Um, first, all of these proposed rates and rate methodologies are presented for informational purposes. They're not guaranteed um, as we move into different conversations around, you know, funding and approval um, that we need to be granted the authority we need. We recognize that there are different steps that we have to make. Um, with that in mind, what we're sharing is not necessarily an operational proposal. I, I assume and I imagine that a lot of you will have a fair amount of questions on the, the operations of this. This is the phase in proposal with this initial feedback that we have now on how the rates themselves look and how the rate methodology was created. Um, with that said, though, please, that doesn't mean I don't welcome the questions because I think that this will, those will make sure that we are keeping the right things in mind as we move forward and also that we have the right areas identified to ensure we're communicating with groups on as you're trying to envision how you and your different seats in the stands would operationalize these things as well or how you as an individual or family member might work within these, these or how you would be impacted by these. Um, BDS is unable to implement rate changes resulting in the need for increased appropriations without legislative approval and additional authority granted to fund these these proposed changes. So the cost we would have to go and ask for this or this funding. Any proposed appropriation increases would need to be included in a future budget development cycle or initiated as a bill during the legislative session. So just as I mentioned before, you know, our opportunity to do that, we would be looking at 7-1 of 2025 if we were to um, advocate for and receive this funding. So that is what we're basing this proposed timeline on. Um, any rate methodology is subject to approval from our federal partners at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as well. So that is also a step that we would have to make sure we make and have full and transparent communication with them on our rate methodology. A um, couple of other points, and Leslie mentioned this before, a rate methodology and the rate itself does not prescribe a process by which a provider agency distributes that funding that they receive, that revenue they receive. So when we talk about the rate methodologies, um, as, as was shared, these are the assumptions that went in to create that methodology and, um, you know, not necessarily how the provider will pass them along. And finally, and just to kind of remind this group and any audience members who weren't present for um, some of the spring sessions where we discussed, discussed an exceptions process, as we start looking at support levels, our group has also been working really hard on advising about and informing what we call an exceptions process. Um, which will make sense in just a little bit when we show some of those, but as support levels are identified, an exceptions process would be a mechanism where somebody could kind of raise their hand and say, hey, this support level doesn't quite feel right. We'd like to ask for an exception for another. So um, I, I just want to just remind us of that too as we're looking. I think that's a common question that comes up. So with that said, I, I know we're all excited to get into the information itself, so I'm going to hand it back to Leslie. Okay, we are going to start with the community participation services. So your CPS services. So what you're seeing right now over on the left, first two columns, that's the current rate structure. 
So your current procedure code descriptions, your current rates, you can see that you get to that level six for DD that it's independently determined, and then you have your PDMS that's also independently determined. The rest of those columns then, this is the proposed. So you can see that we are proposing four different levels for CPS. So your CIS levels one and two, three and four, five and six, and then seven. That is not the same breakout for all services. I just kind of wanted to start that out there. So for CPS, these are the four levels that we're looking at. You also see that we are um, calculating a group rate for groups with four or more individuals. So that's kind of a, a new addition is that group rate. And then you also see the add on for the specialized transportation. And that add on is once again per 15 minute. So this continues to be that per 15 minute rate. So you can see the proposed, the traditional, the non-PDMS rates. Uh, we're starting at 1067 for CIS levels one and two, and then it moves up incrementally as we, we move up those levels. The, um, the difference in there, so wages, as I talked about, um, the occupational codes, we change the weights. Um, so, you know, your, your CIS levels one and two is kind of your, your low to, to moderate um, support needs, low behavioral, low medical, kind of viewed, you know, kind of same staffing ratios for, for those levels. Move up into that CIS levels three and four, um, and you kind of see, you know, increased uh, behavioral needs. And so, you know, we kind of switched the weights. We might have added uh, a higher percentage for psych aids. We added the additional training hours that we saw for, um, for individuals with behavioral health needs. We included that in the productivity factor. And then as we move up into five and six, that then gets into your increased medical needs. We added in those increased or additional uh, medical hours. Once again, change the weights on those occupational codes. Um, and then also kind of, you know, kind of took into account staffing ratios also and things like that, because as you move up, um, to those support needs, you have more, you know, one on one. You might even have some two, you know, two to one staffing ratios um, as you get into those um, those higher supports. So those are kind of all of the different things that that go into as we're seeing those um, increases. Next to that column, you're going to see the proposed PDMS rates. So the the difference between those is that administrative in general component. So those PDMS rates still includes a, a benefits, an employee benefits component. It still includes a productivity component uh, for most services. Um, it doesn't include that A and G, and that is due to that proposed FMS rate that would then reimburse for those administrative and general expenses. Um, so that is the difference there um, for those, those PDMS rates. And then you also see that we have a proposed uh, traditional credentialed rate. Um, so there was a workforce subcommittee um, that a couple of years ago um, that we were able to you know, take the information um, that they pulled together, which was great information, and we're able to then incorporate that um, into a rate methodology uh, for that credentialing. So increases made to, to wages and then also training hours um, to go into that productivity component that calculated into those increased rates. So Leslie, one thing I'll just mention with regard to that subcommittee, because they did a lot of work and they had some really strong recommendations. And one of the things that they really stressed was to ensure that there was flexibility within a PDMS structure so that if an individual or their family um, chose to pursue a credentialing process for their family managed employee, that there was the availability to do that, but that it wouldn't be a requirement. So two new concepts here on the screen in front of people. One, credentialing in general is being introduced here um, as an option in the rate. Again, operationally, we've got to dive in and see what makes sense and how that would be pursued. How would a provider become a credentialed provider, et cetera? 
So we'll be moving forward to put all of those pieces together, but we know that these are the proposed rates for that. Within PDMS specifically, you'll note at the top of the column, so A and G, those administrative expenses, and we talked about those, Ellen asked some really good questions, which I think helped explain this process. So thank you again, El. Um, you know, those are primarily provider functions. But when we talked about some of the um, some of the other expenses in the area of um, I'm sorry, I just had one of those moments where a couple of words just fell right out of my mind. But a couple of um, productivity, Leslie, I'm sorry, program yes. related. Thank you, Lori. You're Thank welcome. you, Lori and Leslie, for saving me program related expenses. As we talked about what those were. We all kind of said, huh, all right, so some of those within a PDMS program make sense, and those are happening right now, but some of those are largely just functions that happen by a provider agency. Most states, and we are not most states, and that's kind of where I'm going with this, most states, when they're developing a PDMS rate, would not include both the program-related expenses and the A&G. We wanted to kind of meet in the middle on that, recognizing that some of those functions happen, but some of them don't, but then also recognizing that that might give the flexibility for an individual or family that chooses pursue, to pursue credentialing to have a source of funding for that credentialing or to distribute as they choose in other areas of that of their budget. So again, rate build up here um, and the, the the concept and what we're moving towards, not necessarily an operational um, explanation on how that would happen. And with that, I, I see hands raising and the boards lighting up. So I will um, let questions come. I just wanted to give a bit of context there on both the credentialing and the PDMS um, approach. Sorry, I think the first hand on the board was Aaron. Aaron so let's go with yeah. Aaron. Yeah, thanks. I just had a quick question. I noticed that it states DD. Are these also going to be the rates for the ABD waiver, or is that going to be different? Um, at this time, we're starting with a phase in structure for the developmental disabilities waiver. It is our largest waiver, and I think that as we look through at some of the steps to operationalize, so for example, as we're using the supports intensity scale, um, you know, just us figuring out do what are the structures that we would need to incorporate some of the other waivers. So just DD at this time. Okay, because we know the SAS isn't the greatest tool for folks who are living with a brain injury. You got it, Erin, exactly. And I think, was there another hand? I thought I saw another hand. I'm sorry. There's a question in the Sue. chat. Yeah, Sue was asking a question about the credentialed. Is it per the individual or per the provider? So this would be for staff at a provider agency, direct service professionals that went through a credentialing program. There are several out there. I think we want to be very careful that we're leaving option and you know option out there for provider agencies. Um, some of the more known ones are um, NADSP, um, also the College of Direct Support Professionals. So those are some programs out there right now, but we would not necessarily prescribe which one. So that would be for the DSP and um, right. the staff of the provider agency. Perfect. Right. Thanks. So Jess, just to summarize that, um, it would, and we, again, as Jess said, this is our, our, we haven't operationalized all this, but we would be looking at that at the provider level if you met a certain a number of your staff being credentialed. So I think that, thank you. Thank you. And then we have a question from Kim Schatz. If a provider delivers PDMS services, they will not be able to charge for ANG. So if a provider delivers PDMS services, our intention is that they would still access that service that or that service rate that they would receive in traditional. We want we don't want to disincentivize PDMS over traditional or vice versa. So if somebody is using their, you know, through a self-directed service um, program and they are purchasing services from a provider, uh, our goal is that the provider would still continue to collect the the rate that they collect in the traditional um, in a traditional program. I don't see any other. Hey, oh, Kim's on the board. Go ahead, yeah. Kim. 
I, I may, you may have said this, but I'm just a little confused. When we would be implementing the rates July of next year? So, no, what we're shooting for is January 1 of 2026. July 1st of 2026 is when our new budget cycle starts. So as we go forward and start to work with our, our legislature and any other advocates who will be engaged in these conversations, um, if we are fortunate enough to receive that funding, we would anticipate it around 1-1 of 2025 with implementation um, marked now for 1-1 of 26. All right. Don't see any other questions now, so I think we can. Okay, we will. I'm gonna go on mute. Go on to community support services is next. So currently, two levels of community support services, and then you have the PDMS rate that's independently determined. Um, right now, the proposal is to continue with two levels. You'll see that the the first level is the CIS levels one, two, and three. And then as we move to CIS level four, that then um, takes you into that second level. Once again, there is a proposed group rate. This group rate is for groups three and or more uh, for that group rate. Uh, for this service, uh, level four is kind of where the support needs move to high along with behavioral support. Um, so the, the increase here um, just kind of made sense at that CIS level four for this particular service. Um, so once again, um, the occupation codes that were used, you know, we, we shifted to, you know, put more percentage to site gates um, for that, that secondary level. And also a change to more one-to-one -one staffing ratios as we, we move up on there. And then additional training for both behavioral and medical, all for that that second um, that second rate. And then the other um, conversation, you know, that the proposed PDMS uh, rates there, uh, same as what we talked about for CPS, and then also for the credentialing. Question in the chat, in Umbrella CPS, we have some individuals grouped with others. Will this affect the individual rates? So, or, so I just want to be clear, Steve is asking about CPS, not CSS? Yes. Umbrella CPS, we have some individuals grouped with others. It, uh, we have, if you go back to the right. CPS slide, we do have a rate for over four individuals together. Um, it would fall into the, the group rate that we are proposing. I'm not sure what you mean about umbrella, Steve. I'm wondering, is it, is it a group rate or is it like if someone is paired with staff maybe? Well, if somebody's paired with staff, if it's, if it's then staff they they would, yeah. yeah, they would still do the, the the different levels. That group rate would only apply if it's four or more individuals. I think that's what Steve's saying, two to one. Oh, um, oh see. Yeah. so I guess, you know, the assumptions that uh, went into the methodology as we moved up into the, the different level of supports, um, some of the... Um, when we looked at staffing ratios, there were some two to one um, that was included in those assumptions. Um, but no, as far as the rate that would get billed um, for that individual, it would be the same rate as we were showing. Hopefully that answered that. So yeah, we wouldn't have a separate rate. It, that two to one ratio is kind of is built into the assumptions. It's built into the methodology. Leslie, and we've got um, Shelly. Hi, so I guess I kind of have a question to go off of those. Two to one to me is two staff to one individual. So we would get in this particular situation, let's say they're the level 
your highest level, 15.86, to staff that individual with two people. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. So once again, you know, that exceptions policy is there. Mm -hmm. If you truly feel that, that, you know, if that person's getting a two to one for all of the hours that yes. they are getting services, that is probably an extraordinary necessarily case. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's where that exception would probably come into play. Okay. And then I'm going to ask a question on the reverse. If I have an individual, I have a staff person with two individuals, do I get the full rate, say again, let's say it's the lower rate, 1067, or do I have to divide that by two? Can you go back? What was the, the ratio? I have one staff person with two individuals. Nope. It's it's the, the the rate that's there. It doesn't get divided by two. the the only The only time that group rate will apply is if it's four or more. And even then, if it's four, that's the group rate per individual. If it's six, that's the group rate per individual. Okay. So, yep. That's my next question. So if I take four people times your two ninety three, that equals eleven seventy two. So if they're a uh, two, three, four, I guess, then I'm kind of, I'm losing money on them, right? Because it's just that rate, it's not an additional to the current rate. Could you say that one more time, Shelly, if you did what? I just want to. Yeah, so I just want to make sure I understand the group rate. So yeah. group rate 293 times four, so that's 11. Oh, yeah. So if I have somebody that's in that second level, 11, 83, I'm technically losing money on them. I'd be better off to serve them one to one or one to two versus. Yeah. Versus well, so first of all, I think um, so that's a 15 minute unit rate, just to be clear. I just want to make, but also if you're serving that many, you know, four or more, usually you're doing some kind of larger group activity that doesn't require two to one staff or one to one staff, Shelly. So we wanted to offer the opportunity. One of the things that we learned through COVID, if we can, you know, look at the positives of that is we heard some some from some individuals that they enjoyed some virtual sessions of certain things. So that's what we would be looking at that. So your cost of staff delivery shouldn't be like, you know, two to one or one to one in that type of situation. Okay, yeah, I just want to understand the group rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And still yeah. with the exception process being a possibility because 100%. I, yeah. you know, echo what Lori said with that kind of assumption in the methodology about that yeah. likely being that higher level of independence or less supports may be needed in the moment. But that's not always true, as we know, too. There could be other, you know, supports yep. that might be needed. So an exceptions process would allow us to consider exactly what you're, I, I think you're getting at, Shelly, so that we can make sure each individual is supported the right way through their services. Okay, great. Thank you. And, yeah, and this is Lori. I just want to reiterate that um, in New Hampshire, one of the things I think we take pride on is person-centered services. So we also wanted to make sure that we were built into these rates, which Leslie has reviewed, is there some expectations of staffing ratio? So like an individual that might have a support need in the level one or level two still needs some one-to-one -one time. And, you know, I might want to participate in this CPS activity. So built into that rate, there are some strong um, assumptions of some individualized time, some paired time. It just doesn't dictate it per, you know, it, it's based, will be based on their plan and the provider. But, you know, as we go into those a little bit more, you'll see that, Shelley. So the assumptions on the rate, but not how that transfers into someone's person's service plan or even Correct. how the provider sets Right, out. right. So I just don't want someone looking at this thinking, if my son or daughter is independent, they won't get any individualized time that that's that that rate is built on quite a bit of, you know, individualized time built into that. We did have a couple. Oh, go ahead. Oh, beautiful. Because I was just going to say, Leslie, I could I could try it. I might be able to get this out to the group, but I think you would be best to explain this next question. 
Um, so I'm going to do Kim's question first. If this doesn't implement until 1126, will the rates be adjusted again for the most recent BLS wage data? So because a request for appropriations needs to be done, uh, the answer is you know, probably not, um, because then if there were any changes that then would affect appropriations, then you, you like so it's the the timing of it really. So, you know, kind of where we're at right now, that's the appropriations that needs to be um, requested. That's not to say that that isn't information that can be looked at every year to kind of see where it's landing, because the inflation factor would also then change. Um, because you're looking at a different time frame. So, you know, we look at BLS, we look at inflation. OK, how does that look now? Um, and because that's how we're building the methodology, that can be looked at then on an annual basis, and especially, you know, when the state chooses to rebase those. But for right now, because of the request for appropriations, I would say uh, no. Um, there had been another question. Will there be any independently determined rates like we have today? And I guess, Lori, I mean, my understanding is, no, you guys are moving away from those independently determined rates as much as possible. <laughs> Again, we will have an exceptions process for those um, unique situations, but the whole point on developing this rate structure was to have um, a methodology that we all use consistently. Yeah, and that was, I mean, that CMS is like there, every state um, is, you know, having to have that that methodology in place that they can show how those rates are calculated. Um, will the appropriation include an annual cost of living rate adjustment? I guess we have the inflation factor that's built into the wage as far as, um, you know, it's, it's, know it's kind of built in there and then because some of those components are a percentage of the wage then that kind of flows through the rest of that rate methodology um, but I don't think right now that they were planning on increasing the appropriation um, per year to include an annual cost of living rate adjustment because the methodology and that rate would be in place until it was rebased. And then will rebasing happen every five years or will this be looked at every biennium? So I think that touches a little bit upon some of the cost report discussions that are going on and how we want to move forward and just some some key points from this group to um, asking for us to just make sure we're very clear in the utilization of the cost reports, what the outcome will be, if those connect to rates. Um, and what that cycle will look like for a rebasing process. So that's something that we will also be working on, as I discussed, when we talk about the operational component of this and how we'll phase those out. These are great questions to folks because they help us to, as I mentioned, create our communication, make sure our eye is on the right things and the questions you all will likely have as you're putting your op strategies in place and doing some reviews um, internally too. So I'm um, you know, as Leslie just said, things like cost of living um, and then rebasing, how all of those are impacting the rate and what that rebasing schedule looks like will be more information that we'll start to address as we as we dive into some of those details of the rollout. Ellen, I saw your hand up. Yes, thanks. I, you know, I can't help myself. I think it's worth stating that we kind of did have a rate methodology that was in place years ago. I know that folks couldn't figure out the whys and wherefores behind it. But I think the need for the individual rate was because we didn't get um, support from the legislature to increase rates for, you know, I mean, what is it, two increases over, I don't know what it was, 15 or 20 years. That's why you saw the volume move into individually determined rates is because those established rates couldn't support the 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 waiver services. So I, I just think it's important to note because we're starting fresh. We've got a new rate system. That's awesome. And we need to, you know, make sure that rate increases keep up with it. So we're not driven to use individually, you know, that we're not doing those uh, exemptions, Lori, every, at every turn. 
because up to to do otherwise is unsustainable. So absolutely, Ellen. I think you touched on a few good points, which is us just making sure that we are leading with a transparent rate methodology, that we're doing, you know, the the cost reporting that might be necessary. Um, you know, should we choose to you know, move into that direction or that our methodology in and of itself, even separate from a cost reporting um, structure, can support and show to our partners in the legislature what the cost in, of the rates um, looks like as time goes on, as cost of living adjusts. And we, you know, through a lot of updates that have been happening, are in a position of collecting much um, much more data and much more specific data so that we can have those conversations and show that to continue to get the support that we've received from our legislative partners in a, a very transparent and informative way. Um, so I, I think that's what we're truly hoping that this rate methodology creates for us is, is information and then the data that we have to go along with it to continue to support um, the the information that might be needed for folks um, on the legislative level to to you know, really see what we're what we're saying, what that significant investment um, that it is it is worth it. It's necessary, and it is so critical to make sure we have a robust service system. Yeah, I mean, arguably, if we didn't get legislative support, we now have rates on which we can apply our own inflation factors to point out how much we're being underfunded. But that's that's a topic for another day. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to propose, so we've looked at two of the four rates. We've got about 30 minutes left, so I want to make sure we have an opportunity for, you know, just as robust a discussion on those two rates. Um, so let's roll in, but, you know, questions are great. As I said, we don't mind kind of going back and looking at things as they all pop into your mind as you're evaluating and processing things. Could we just look, show the CPS uh, seat? Yeah, thank you. I felt like we moved off this quick, so I yeah, wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah folks had a moment to ask questions about CSS. Okay. Looks like we're good with that. Respite is next. So right now there's uh, two different levels of respite. That, that second level is like your, your medical behavioral um, I know it looks there's there's a lot of, of different rates here, so we are still looking at two levels of, of respite. So CIS levels one and two, and then CIS levels three to seven. Um, so it's kind of where the, the support needs can move, um, but also that that behavioral and medical. So kind of kind of move in that there. Uh, we're adding that behavioral and medical uh, training hours that I've talked about um, that we saw for for respite. And that's then giving us that that increase in the rate. So for respite, we also are looking at kind of the different ways that respite is done in the state. So you have your agency arranged respite. So your, your agency staffed respite, um, you have your family arranged respite, and then your PDMS family arranged respite. So that's kind of um, kind of where that, that breakout is as well. Um, and looking at, um, you know, there's that 10% like administrative in general uh, piece that's factored in um to i believe that that is the family arranged hold on a second let me make sure i don't have that piece up yeah so that 10 percent there on that family arranged respite the a and g percentage there is 10 percent um so that's the difference in that uh that that rate and then your you see your your PDMS that doesn't include the the A and G there for the um, for the the PDMS family arranged. And you also see that some of those do have that credentialing again, um, not all of them, um, but it is kind of applied in there.
Hey, Leslie. Yep. Um, what what is this? You know, we don't have percent, but like percent increase. It, like I'm just looking, thinking of like relative to um, Dayhab. Like, is this a similar increase? It just. Oh, um, no, I don't believe so. But hold on a second. I don't think we have a comparison between. I mean, like Lori mentioned before, we tried really hard to make sure we were looking at each of these services based on the service themselves, the feedback sure. that people were sharing, things like that. So yeah, I'm not I mean, so I sure it would that. even correlate. Um, I'm not trying to correlate. It's just fascinating to look at the difference. Like, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I can do it from the slides. I'm just I. Yeah, OK. Yeah, but no, I mean, it, it wasn't. I mean, it, it, it was something that we looked at as we were like, you know, calculating that that first methodology to say, hey, you know, it's it's this percentage increase. But that didn't factor into, you know, I guess, decisions that were made or anything like that following yeah. the methodology and the assumptions. It's just that some services, I mean, you guys know CSS, it's not utilized very much because it's just low rates. Um, and so, you know, you would anticipate that you would have a an increase there. Um, you know, same with respite. Yeah. Uh, being 290 for that 15 minute. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. It really yeah. Is service Thank you. By service. Thank um, you. Everybody. I have a question. If respite is provided for a full 24 hours in a day, is there a daily rate or would you bill 24 hours for that day? Sorry, Jess. So that's a good question. Right now, these rates are based on um, the 15 minute units, but we do know that families might um, pay a daily rate to an individual. So that's, you know, and again, and how do we look at operationalizing some of this? I don't know, Jess, if you wanted to add to that. No, I think that's spot on, Lori. I mean, I, I think even in the current structure, as we look at that, you know, how does that relate here? We have our 15 minute units, but to your point, as we operationalize this, this is just a good question for us to take back and make sure that we're working with you all as you try mm -hmm. to figure out how does this you know, how does this work in my day to day and how do we apply this? Thank you. And then, you know, so we are discussing DD only today. We will discuss ABD in a different forum. That is correct. Yes, Lori, Jess, anything you want to add on that? No, that's that's accurate. We're looking at the DD waiver rates. Okay. We can come back to respite if we need to. So the last one that we'll talk about today is supported employment. So once again, for supported employment, right now there's three different levels. That level three DD is where that independently determined rate is. We are um, proposing two different levels. That's CIS levels one, two, and three, moving up uh, at level four to a, a separate rate once again. That's kind of where those support needs move up to, um, you know, very high with that behavioral. Um, so the additional training hours for individuals with behavioral and medical needs gets added at that level. Um, there's only one occupational code that we're actually using for supported employment services. Um, so it's really the, those additional training hours and then also staffing ratio assumptions as we get up into those higher levels, have more one on one and two to, two to one that's included in those assumptions. So uh, there is some two to one that's included in those assumptions um, and one to one as we move up into that second uh, level of rate. Once again, there's a proposed group rate that would start at groups of three or more. And once again, we have that specialized transportation add on. Which I don't know if I talked about, we have the specialized transportation add on for CSS as well. Um, we do not have that for respite.
Any, any questions around supported employment? That's the last service that we were going to talk about today. So I gather folks are considering processing, you know, taking it in. You know, there have been some great converse or some great questions coming through. We encourage you to keep submitting those questions, as I said. Um, and, and the next steps of this would really for be for us to go back, look at how, like, what are all the steps? What are all the, you know, the independent actions, the interdependent actions that would need to happen so that we can identify for folks how this all comes together in, you know, in preparation for January 1, 2026. Erin uh, has a question. Just a quick question. Has the fiscal um, come, you know, how it fiscally is going to affect everything been figured out in regards to having to go to legislation and what we're going to need to do in regards to that? So we are starting those budget conversations now and we're, you know, really in the, the first phase of that. So, yes, we do have some, you know, information prepared based on this and what the impact would be, but how those conversations happen, I, I think that's the, the the step we're on at this point, you know, how and when and, you know, and certainly any education information um, resources that we're asked and hopefully that any of you might be asked for from our legislature or folks that talk to them, you know, hopefully we can all provide that as much and as often as folks think is necessary for them to make any type of decision that might be put before them. But we're kind of just starting that, I guess, is the, the best answer to your question, Erin. Okay, thanks. Your questions in the chat, so. Any other questions? I mean, we have we do have until noon today, so I want to make sure we can answer questions. But at the same time, if folks are thinking they want to go back and talk to their teams and maybe more questions will come up. Um, it looks like we have one in the chat. It's, 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 it would be great if there could be parity in supported employment that is being provided in other areas of DHHS. Will there be a review on that? Um, so that gets into, and I'm not sure if we have any of our partners from um, rate setting, Christy Roy, but my understanding, and again, I'm not speaking as a subject matter expert on that. This is just kind of the Jess Gorton take. Um, some of the other areas in the of services in DHHS, as people might be aware, are um, done through a managed care structure, and ours are not. So I, I don't want to get too far down the road of what parity looks like, how it's brought up. I'm just aware that that is a component that's um, that happens that we don't necessarily work through in our service system. But I'm sure that's a question that we can bring to Christy Roy and her team. Um, she works in our, she oversees our rate setting department and, you know, certainly get some sort of more robust answer out to folks than that. The next question, I apologize if I missed this, but when will we see residential rates? Uh, residential rates. So on our timetable, we were projecting, um, I, I think in our minds, the September-ish area of 27 um, is what we were, were initially trying to target for after we get all of this information. One of the reasons being, as we were considering some of the stakeholder input, our current residential services are all in an umbrella of just residential habilitation. There are several different program models that an individual might pursue for their service participation. And in order for us to implement those, we also need to update some of the waiver services. So instead of one service for residential, we'd be looking at, say, a shared family living or enhanced family care, um, as it's called in, in some parts of the state. Um, also a, um, excuse me, staff residence. Um, one of the questions we've been asking with regard to intensive treatment services is does that, you know, and working strongly with our, our partners and um, our subject matter experts, internal and external, you know, would that be best done through a specific service or, you know, not? So before we make those decisions and also recognize it would require amendment updates, it would require changes in service authorizations. And really, we just want to make sure that we have some learnings from these services first before we move there. We 
propose that we do that light later in 27 when we have all those key learnings and we've identified, communicated, and set expectations for our individuals and families, service coordinators, and providers about what all of those changes would look like. So kind of just what we're doing now, you know, where we're talking, you know, August 2024, we're looking at implementation of these January 1, you know, Jess is talking about implementation of September of 27. So, you know, you would see rates previous to that, knowing that it would be implemented then, um, or at least that that's the plan. So somewhere before, you know, maybe late 2026, which seems far away, but boy, these last couple of years have gone quick. So, <laughs> and then will the slide deck be sent to us? And yes, it will. And I think it was mentioned early, there is an appendix to the slide deck that does talk about the different CIS levels um, and just kind of has some addi additional information um, that's kind of just supplemental to what we've talked about and that has been um, talked about previously in, in previous presentations. Uh, does group three plus mean greater than three or three or more? That is three or more. So three plus would be three or more and four plus would be four or more. Um, can we share the slide deck with others once we receive it? Yes, I, I do believe this is out at any internal partners who disagree, but I, I think our, and we anticipate and expected that folks would likely want to share this, especially internal with, um, you know, within provider agencies as you start to scan, what does this mean across the board and, you know, be able to give us the most robust feedback you can. So we'll, yes, please. And we really do want to hear back from folks about, you know, how, you know, what what's being, what the discussions are and what we can do to help with either communication or keep in mind from an operational standpoint. One thing I would add to that too, Will, is if you do share it with others, I would also direct them back to the BDS website so they could view this recording once it's posted so they have the full context of the conversation and not just the slide deck, as well as once the minutes are posted, that should assist in um, helping to understand these slides as well. And to the extent that you feel comfortable sharing, if not, we are happy to do this, is all of this is subject to the approval from various authorities and and partners that we have. And the question, will the details of the rates in the build-up model be shared? So let's kind of take that back, I think, to see, because I, I think I'm understanding the, the level of detail that Sue's asking for, but I might want to just confirm that we have that information set to share. I do believe we had prepared some additional um, information too. So let me just make sure I understand the correct or the question correctly, Sue, and see what we can get out to get that information. Excuse me, what we can provide to answer that okay, or to you. give that detail. This is related to the rates. Are there going to be adjusted by geographic region? Not at this time. Um, when we looked at the BLS data, uh, by geographic region for the occupational codes that are, are mostly used um, or being proposed to use. Um, there just wasn't a, a very large difference um, in there in order to um, have those, those different rates and to have to have all of those different procedure codes um, for billing and such. But again, that's in the rate methodology itself. As you as provider agencies, if you see a benefit or, you know, you know, a distribution of the revenue, we are not prescribing how you might take this rate and, and do that type of assessment for your own agencies. Does this mean there will be no additional funds for residential until 2028? That we are proposing a, a rollout of residential in late 2027. If there are additional questions we have as we consider this further, who do we direct those to? I would ask that they please, just so that we can keep them all in one place to send them to the, the BDS email and we'll make sure to flash that or maybe Jess Kennedy, if you'd be willing to drop that in the chat too um, for the group right there, it'll be on your deck. I do believe it's a link when you get the deck and we can make sure that that's in the chat too so that folks have it. Thanks, Jess. 
If you want to label the subject line rates, it will yeah. be very helpful. Thank yeah. you. All right, so the, the next rate work group will be next month, Friday, September 20th, 10 a.m. Um, please, please, as I said, send your questions as they as you start having them to the BDS inbox. And then next month, you know, if, if other questions arise, happy to take them then at that time as well. So thank you all for joining. I don't see other questions. I want to make sure that I've, I'm not ending too early happy to stay on if folks have more questions but if not thank you all for for joining i, I hope this provided some initial information to, to help and eager to hear some of the the feedback and the responses so that we just make sure we're getting the information out um, to help everybody as we as we work towards this so have a, a nice remainder of your friday and enjoy your weekends and take care everyone thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.